this is the last of our recombinant DNA technology lectures. And we have been talking about plasmids and the use of plasmids in recombinant DNA technology. Now we are going to quickly go over the use of the phage vector. So how do you use phage vectors very similarly to the plasmid where you would take a um, genes from the cellular genome and cut them all with restriction enzymes. You then have bacteriophage, which as you know are viruses that infect bacteria. You can extract DNA from a bacteriophage and cut that DNA also with restriction enzymes. You can then ligate the chromosomal DNA with the viral DNA to make recombinant DNA. You can then package this recombinant DNA into phages to make hybrid phages, just like you made you know, hybrid plasmids. You can then take these uh, viruses and use them to infect bacteria, which will then cause the viruses to propagate, making many different, many of these viruses containing the hybrid phage. You then take the bacteria and spread it out on agar media, just like you would do with bacteria. You're going to get a lawn of bacteria, except where areas where you have your uh, virus or phage, you're going to get lysis of the bacteria, and you're going to get plaques or clear zones. So wherever you have a plaque, that's where you have your virus containing your hybrid or recombinant DNA, and you can collect these plaques to make a whole library of phage clones. Now, we can use these types of technology, the phage and the um, plasmids, our recombinant DNA technology, to um, use it for gene therapy. So how do we use this for gene therapy? One example is we can make insulin. And by making insulin, we can use this insulin to treat patients with diabetes. So how do we use recombinant DNA technology to make in insulin? You can take the pancreas, and within the pancreas, you have your cells that produce insulin, the islet of Langerhans cells. You can then it, uh, amplify the genes in those cells, the gene that is the insulin producing gene. Once you amplify that gene, you wanna cut it with the appropriate restriction enzymes to make your appropriate ends. You then are gonna take a plasmid and cut that plasmid so that it makes appropriate ends that match the ends of the gene. You then, of course, ligate them together so that you have now your recombinant plasmid. And now you take that recombinant plasmid and you put it back into the bacteria in order to propagate that plasmid. Now this bacteria will, with the, pl with the recombinant plasmid, will allow that gene that's in that plasmid to make insulin. You can then purify the insulin and then use it to treat patients. You can also use this type of technology to make a vaccine for hepatitis B. And as healthcare workers, we all get vaccinated against hepatitis B. So what you want to do is isolate the hepatitis B surface antigen gene from the hepatitis B virus, and you can then clone that gene. So what you would do is you would make your recombinant DNA with your hepatitis B surface antigen gene, 
you would then transform this recombinant DNA into yeast cells, very similarly to uh, transforming a recombinant DNA into bacteria. You can transform into yeast, grow the yeast on agar plates, again, just like you would bacteria, and then you can grow up the yeast, lyse them to um, isolate your hepatitis B vaccine. You can also use this technology to make factor eight in order to treat patients with hemophilia. So how you would do this is you would take your gene that encodes for factor eight. You would then package that gene inside of an appropriate virus. So some viruses that you can use are things like adenovirus. There's, there's several other viruses that you can use that will then infect human cells. So a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. For this instance, you'd want to use a virus that you can infect human cells with it. The factor eight gene will then get in, encoded into the human chromosomal DNA and will start to make factor eight protein when previously the cells were, were not able to make the factor eight protein. So these are all various examples of how recombinant DNA technology can be used to treat various um, diseases. So recombinant DNA is a very important technology for gene therapy, genetic engineering, and there's a lot of gene therapy research being done in order to create new treatments, new vaccines using recombinant DNA. So for example, another use of gene therapy is to correct a malfunctioning gene. So in this case, you have a cell you have the nuclear or genomic DNA, and inside the DNA, there's a defective gene. So this gene is not working properly. What you can do is you can take a viral vector, this is adenovirus, and put in a functional copy of the same gene. The virus will then go in and insert the corrected or functional gene into the human cellular genome and now you have a functioning gene in that cell. So the things that are important are how you're going to deliver that DNA into the cell. You always want to design these experiments so that they'll work properly. Now, of course, as with any technology, there can be some problems. So some of the problems with genetic therapy, gene therapy, genetic engineering, is that you can get toxicity. So some genes are going to be toxic in certain cells. So that is one thing to consider. Another thing for vaccine development is you want to make sure that you stimulate an immune response inside an individual. So adenovirus, the virus that causes the common cold, is sometimes a virus used for gene therapy. Now the key is, is using a vector that could possibly stimulate an immune response, but not generate a massive immune response, which would lead to an autoimmune disease, or a, a very enhanced inflammatory response, because you wouldn't want to make an individual sick when you're trying to treat them. The problem with adenovirus is it does stimulate the immune system, but it has a very short survival. So you have to be careful with how you are using some of these vectors. There are other vectors, non-viral vectors, but those have poor transfer. So viruses seem to be the more common vector used to treat human diseases. Another thing to consider is gene control. 
So you want to make sure that you're not putting in a gene maybe that will regulate many other genes, upregulate genes or downregulate genes so that you cause all sorts of other problems in the cell. So you always have to consider what vector you're using. Is it going to lead to toxicity? Is there going to be an immune response? Is it going to be an adequate immune response? Is it going to be too much of an immune response? Will it stay in the body long enough for that gene to do the job that you want it to do? And what type of gene control do you have to consider? What are you targeting? What cells do you need to target? So there are various problems and, and always things that need to be considered when you're designing these types of gene therapies. Things to always consider. In order to make a genetic therapy, you have to understand how that gene works. You can't just go throwing any gene inside a cell and just hope for the best. You really wanna have a good understanding of how the gene works before you start using it for gene therapy, which is why most experiments start out with plasmids and bacteria and then maybe move into an animal model before they're finally moved into clinical trials in humans. Another thing to consider is that genes, just like this little rack here, have more than one function, many of them. So we have this shelf here that's being used as a plant holder, it's being used as a shelf to store things, and it's also being used as a bike rack. Well, our genes are very similar. We have genes that have many, many, many functions. So sometimes you can't use one gene and expect it to have one outcome. There might be many, many, many different outcomes and some of them may not be positive outcomes. The other thing to consider is gene expression. How is that gene expressed? In what cells are, is that gene expressed? So you don't want anything that's going to overexpress another gene that might lead to a disease. So these are all things that have to be very clearly understood before gene therapy is utilized. Another thing to consider is gene interactions. Very few genetic diseases are due to one single gene. Those that are due to one single gene, gene therapy works really well. But those diseases that are due to multiple genes, those are much more difficult to treat using gene therapy because you'd have to replace or insert 15 or 20 different genes into the cell and you never know how those genes are going to interact with other genes or with the environment that you place them into. They, they might not behave the way you think they're going to behave. So gene therapy at this stage can't work to treat all the different diseases that are out there. And we all know that recombinant DNA opens up a Pandora's box. There are all sorts of ethical concerns with using recombinant DNA technology. Some of those being using recombinant DNA technology to engineer food or engineer crops that might be resistant to certain bugs or pesticides, things like that. Some people do have a, a severe concern eating um, recombinant DNA or engineered food products. We can engineer microbes, microorganisms, and there's that possibility of producing an organism that can all of a sudden kill massive amounts of people or produce some deadly toxin. That would be a concern of, you know, a bio threat concern. We have other uh, ethical issues. Human cloning, the Dolly issue, is, is also a, a huge concern. 